Right. Blessings, blessings. Let's keep Mrs. Ashton happy. <laughs> Three, <laughs> two, one. Welcome to the Monday edition of Anglican Unscripted. And I have already forgotten what episode this is. So, 539. Thank you, Gavin. And it's episode 539. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashen, and it's also the last day of the month, the 30th of September, 2019. Okay, welcome to another program. I just drove back from uh, Ridgecrest, North Carolina. I got back about uh, 3 a.m. A little tired. It's a 12-hour drive. And so I may seem out of it for most of the program, so I'm going to allow my wonderful co-host to host host. <laughs> so uh, normally at this point, I tell you guys to like the program. Please like it, share it, love it, comment. Um, it's really wonderful to see how this program continues in the comments. Uh, we're getting you know almost 100 comments per episode. That's wonderful. Um, and I got to say, we have an extremely I'm going to jump in here, Seth. Because smart we have audience. people who say, oh, well, Kevin, why should I like it until I've sat all the way through it and give you my honest opinion? Well, I think people don't understand what we're asking for. They don't understand how the algorithms and the dynamics of ranking work. We, if you want to support this show, because you're not asked to give any money, the way YouTube works is if you like it or share it, that allows YouTube to say, Ooh, maybe we should put this up and advertise it to others. So you, you, please do not mistake Kevin's encouragement to like the show as some sort of vulgar self-promotion. Unless you guys want to start paying for this, you need to like it and share it. If you don't like it and share it, we're threatening we'll have your audience. Conversations, and I'll have to start holding up a packs of Lucky Strikes and say, and you know, the tobacco company would love for us to advertise. Snapple, Snapple. <laughs> did I? Wendy's. Did, you know, let's all. Uh, yeah, we can oh, think of plenty of things to advertise. But folks, if you want this show to continue, you have to support it. Otherwise, don't bitch and moan. I just learned something new, George. <laughs> you're, you're harder on them than I am. Um, at the top well, of the Snapple cap... The the, stuff that people come oh, up with. It's just fine, don't right? this. We still have the best audience out there. On the top of the Snapple <laughs> caps, they give you incredible facts. Did you know that Thomas Jefferson invented the coat hanger? Who knew? I didn't know. I know. Wow. <laughs> I mean, what a, what a lasting if legacy. I'm on Jeopardy. I'll be able to answer that question. That's right. And then we okay. won't have to advertise or ask for likes because we'll all support this. So or I was in the, a, in the let me give it, uh, what's not to like. Yeah. Let me give a quick, quick synopsis of New Wineskin's great conference. It's every three years. It's where the missionaries come in from the field and uh, gather together at Ridgecrest, North Carolina. They have a pre-conference, which George was teaching the communicators how to communicate better. And I got to live stream and videotape the um, real conference. And you guys can go to the new Wineskins web uh, Facebook page and watch that. I'm putting the link in the show notes. Um, it's my favorite conference to go to other than a GAFCON. I guess that's a little better, but that's only like once every you know five or three years. 10 years, something like that. So let's move on to the news. There's several uh, Episcopal stories, and there's certainly a couple English stories we need to cover. That's the automatic cat feeder. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> making noise. So the cat's like not going to be... Brand name, I and mean, we could get some money out of this. And no, we, well, we'd the, a few likes. you can't see, but the cat was in my lap. And once he hears that little noise go off, all four... Uh, paws, claw, as he jumps off the lap. And uh, I try not to make the face of pain that I just experienced. So let's talk quickly about some of the local stories. Um, George, uh, get us started. Oh, the Episcopal House of Bishops met up, I think it was Minneapolis or some godforsaken place in the frozen north. That's it. And they didn't really talk about Bill Love because that's sub judice that's the right way to say that word. It's under it, under legal proceedings, so it really was not an issue. It was something that people spoke about in private, but it really was not an issue of debate. The main th amount of energy and heat was generated over the issue of spouses of partnered uh, gay and lesbian bishops not being invited to Lambeth. 
And they talked about this at great length and they had a vote on the final statement. And the final statement was 60 yeas, 17 nays, and five abstentions. Uh, where the final statement was, we are divided and we're going to let each person make their own decision about this. Some of us are so angry, we're not coming. Some of us are so angry, we're going to come and just make a stink about it when we're there. Others don't care. And on one level, I sort of think the Episcopal bishops sort of played it straight. They are not of one mind. They're never going to be of one mind. And they might as well say, look, we can't agree about this. So we're going to say we agree that we don't agree. And then we'll let each individual make his own decision. There are some minority statements. The Bishop of Central Florida put out a statement saying this is embarrassing. I mean, basically, people can say that we are not of one mind and we really need to support the Archbishop of Canterbury and all hang together. Now, he is my bishop, and of course, he's always right, never been yes, wrong in his life. <laughs> but perhaps I would not be as strong in wanting to say the Archbishop of Canterbury is the hero who will save us from all these bad things. The, the, the safest person in the room is our bishops. Uh, we have a general standing rule that uh, we will not uh, complain publicly about uh, s public statements our bishops make. And so. But, um, you know, Ke Kevin, Kevin, I mean. When did it become a thing to bring your wife or your husband to a clergy conference? I've ne 25 years, I've never brought my wife, Susan, to a clergy conference, and I've never been to one where there's any facilities or anything for them to do. It, matrimonially, it's a bit mean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, what, and, and even, what's the history of the spouses conference at Lambeth? Western spouses in 88 came and based in 78 and 88 came and they were basically given tea parties and tours because they were their husbands were wealthy enough to bring them along. 98 Eileen Carey sort of wanted to do something a bit more and she organized various activities for the visiting spouses but and 2008 it got even bigger. Now this current 2020 conference the statement is that spouses are an integral part of the ministry of the episcopate. And I'm thinking, what church am I belonging to? When did this happen? And, and where I don't see this in the prayer book. I certainly don't see it in the Bible, apart from only having one wife at a time. Uh, Episcopal Church will have to be divorced and remarried. It's only one at a time legally. Uh, but where did this wives and spouses or husbands need to be an integral part of the deliberations of the broader church come from? Well, I think the Lambeth has stopped doing anything of substance for the church, uh, certainly in the last two or three uh, get-togethers. And this is just a way to draw more people in. I mean, they offer the health clinics, obviously, and um, uh, checkups and dentist uh, appointments for some of the African bishops who don't have access to stuff like that. But this is a way to be sure they come. Listen, it's not just a boring three-week conference in England. It's a boring three-week conference in England, and you might have tea with the queen. You, you got to sell it. It's something no, you're you... not going to have tea with the queen. Oh, you're what? Be... No, no, because I've been there. I was invited to that garden party. Yeah. You don't, unless you're an archbishop and his spouse, you get to stand about t eight to ten people deep, watch the queen with Prince Philip come down a road, nod to people, do a little wave, and then go to a small tent where only two or three dozen people circulate, the archbishops and their ah, spouses. I did not know but, that. But if you're a regular old Joe, if you're one of the 800 Anglican bishops who are there, you're as likely to see the queen uh, as a reporter or anybody else. Well, my assumption is, because most have said so, that a lot of the archbishops out there, whether they support us or don't, watch the program. And I assume the queen did. I might be wrong. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't have her iPad on uh, Anglican TV all the time watching Anglican Unscripted. Um, that there was a little interesting development. Rowan Williams was in Los Angeles last week, and he spoke at the uh, installation of the Cathedra, St. John's Cathedral. Mm -hmm. I think it's St. John's in L.A. And he gave a little clergy presentation to about 150 L.A. clergy, and he talked about Lambeth 2008. And he said he had set out from the very beginning not to have any resolutions, not to have any meaningful discussions of the issues, because he saw that the far left and far right, as he labeled them, were irreconcilable. And the only way forward was to drown the whole thing in a miasma or fog of feel-goodism. In Daba. Yes. 
And the purpose of Indaba, according to Rowan Williams, was to basically uh, dull the senses and dull the mind so much that they got through everything. Well, because he also, it was, there was no way to reconcile left and right. He Rowan, also, here's the thing. Okay. Rowan Williams said, you go to Tanzania, you go to Sudan, you go to Nigeria, and the Anglican bishops there will say, when these uh, English and Welsh and American gay bishops get out there, it causes people in our country to die because the Muslims will kill us or we lose people to the Pentecostals because the Pentecostals say, look, you're not Christians. Look, here's the Bible. And look, you've got people viol viol violating the clear words of the Bible. Oh, and, and more, more than that, you lose people to Islam. It's not the Pentecostals who, who benefit from uh, disillusioned and uh, disturbed Christians. Uh, it's Islam. They, they, they say we, we can no longer be Christians in our African culture, but we can be Muslims. And so the effect of uh, our preoccupation with, with sexuality and genitals and romantic sex is that we we create this seismic shift in Africa from Christian to Islam, the very the, the very opposite of what we should be doing. We're longing to strengthen Christians in Africa against this enormous thrust that's taking place between the two faith community ideologies, and and there isn't any sense, as far as I can see, in our church that by supporting this 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 progressive view the gospel is undermined in a critical way in a critical part of the world. Rowan said something else really important that I that stuck out to me. He said, we're not a communion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oop, he, he, he understands. He gets it. Justin doesn't quite understand yet, but, you know, that boat has sailed. That, you know, we're not a communion. This isn't a real Lambeth. This is just kind of a get-together, trying to get the band back together before everybody's 70. Um, he called I, it family. He said it's better to describe it as a family because it's not a con it's not a communion. All right. Hmm. Crazy. All right. So uh, that's some news. What else did we have? I didn't even take notes. That's how tired I was. I just South I was over Africa. here drooling in the pre-show. So Talk about South Africa a bit, basically, and hey, somebody sure. is having heart palpitations or their phone's going off. No, I, 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 I thought Kevin, you really haven't taken the care with your phone. <laughs> 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 It was yours. <laughs> if it's vibrated in your pocket, you don't know it's yours, you got problems. I'm really sorry. We're making a, a strange and unusual noise. I must have it on a strange setting. I, I'd like, if we could, to talk about the Cornish newspaper. Sure, please. Uh, and the, 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 the new Joseph Goebbels onslaught on Orthodox Christianity, because it's been one of the things that's really shaken me considerably. Um, the, the story so far is a rather sweet and encouraging one uh, in a very beautiful fishing village in Cornwall, right at the far bottom left-hand side of England, although the Cornish are not altogether sure they're English, but anyway, there's a, a fishing village called Fowey, uh, pronounced in American Fui. <laughs> and, and there there's a, a, a really very good vicar called Philip de Grey Waters, uh, and he's built up a very enthusiastic Anglican congregation in the parish, the ancient parish church there. But he decided he could no longer remain in the Church of England. And so with his congregation support, and it contains two very notable and impressive characters, Dan and Susie Leaf, are part of his congregation. Together they've withdrawn from the Church of England and they're going to start a new independent Anglican congregation. They've chosen to, to, to join uh, Amy and um, Congratulations to them on their on their taste and judgment, um, and uh, it all looked really very good uh, and the beginning of a movement that we're encouraging very strongly as people of conviction step aside from a church of England that can't be saved. So he was in the I should say they did it in a very genteel, gentle way. Yeah, there they really did. no the bishop was okay too, no yeah. accusations of heresy. Bishop Mount Stephen down in Truro was not lambasted for being the Antichrist. Uh, it was done as well as it could be done in such circumstances. It, it was. In fact, I thought they were they were being a little bit too genteel, a little bit too civilized. I thought, what's the point of making this dramatic prophetic gesture if you're going to cover the decadent 
a, 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 the uh, institution full of apostasy with compliments. Anyway, that's how they did it. Bless them. The next thing that happened was they were interviewed by a local reporter. And George points out that this was an internet publication and not hugely influential. But what was chilling was the was the political sophistication which with which Mr. De Grey Waters has been damned. So this reporter, it's a small community, and he's gone to 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 Philip and said, "I put it to you that you're an extremist organisation, you're right wing, uh, and homophobic and extreme. What have you got to say?" And the, the the vicar, clearly a bit taken aback by this, gives all the right answers and says. Uh, actually, we're leaving because of the way the bishops have dedicated the baptismal liturgy to a to a trans identity. And I'd have done this if they'd used the baptismal liturgy for anything, like the prosperity gospel. It's not a it's not about uh, trans issues or or gay issues. And rather than listening to him and paying attention, the reporter then goes to the local community and and has people say, "Yeah, well, they belong to Gafcon. You know, Gafcon thinks being homosexual is is a sickness you can be cured from." And uh, and then he asks someone uh, in the local community, you know, what do you think of these extremists amongst you? She says, oh, extremists? We don't want extremists here. We're a quiet, peaceful, tolerant village. And so this 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 poor congregation have, in a very sophisticated way, been set up brutally by this leftist progressive agenda. And if I was the vicar and this was published or read much, it would be very hard to come back from. Actually, of course, this is what they're going to do to all of us. Uh, all of us are going to be associated with this Nazi extreme homophobic movement called GAFCON that is going to divide communities. I remember thinking that that, that in, the, in Marxism 1.0 in the Soviet Union, Christians were deemed mad for not believing in the Soviet okay. state experiment, Correct, yeah. and they were they were sent to psychiatric institutions because politically speaking they were mad, um, and I thought that was a terrible thing to do. But it, but it, but at least if you spoke rationally, even though the state had defined you as being mad, other people would notice you were not mad, and they would know this was a political stratagem. The horror of this is that because we've got this particular kind of thought crime, it doesn't matter what you say in response to being told you're an extremist, homophobic right-wing organized member of an organization because nobody will believe what you say and we are very badly stitched up and we need to try and find imaginative ways of, of undercutting the narrative in fact i lie in bed at night <laughs> thinking of ways in which in, you know clever one-liners that one can somehow displace this whole world view upon which this con this sophisticated condemnation is based but you can't i mean this is this is the end times. This is the evil that uh, is going to be partaken upon us. This is Rome, year 60 AD. Uh, but you can't fix stupid reporters. That's yes, not fixable. You yes, you can. No, you can. Uh, well, uh, let me come at this from a reporter's perspective. Sure. I used to write for an art or publication called Get Religion, where we do reporters critiquing uh, the reporters of uh, the writing of other reporters. This uh, article is as bad as it gets this is joseph goebbels style uh baiting uh false truths uh i asked somebody who used to live in the town and i told them what was happening and what did they think <laughs> that's your so so what's happening here is the the reporter is lying he didn't actually ask anybody he makes up false characters puts words in their mouth and allows his opinions to be masqueraded as commentary he uh, basically, uh, he has disqualified himself from the fellowship of real reporters and is a uh, uh, propagandist. Now, he will find work as a propagandist, but he'll never find work as a real reporter in a publication that values journalism. Now, sadly, there are fewer and fewer publications that value journalism. But the thing is, Kevin, after a certain point, um, I, I'll believe, reveal my prejudices. I turn on television news and I then switch to the next channel and I wind up watching a home and garden show because I have no confidence yeah. in what I'm being told is truthful because I'm able to identify, not because I have deep knowledge of the subject matter at hand, but because I have a knowledge of how this all works, how the sausage is made. 
that these people are not engaged in reporting, they're engaged in propaganda. And people turn off from the news. People, people are not buying newspapers. They're not watching television the way they used to. They're going to sources that seek to reinforce their mindset. Okay. So for the gay and lesbian lobby in Cornwall, however big or small that is, this will be exactly what they think is happening. For anybody no, I, outside that lobby, I think they'll just dismiss it as being the ravings of a crank. No, I, I, I don't think, I was going to say I agree with most of what you said, George, but it, 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 now you said I, I don't, don't agree with that. I mean, everything you said so far is true. You know, he, he's a propagandist, not a reporter. Uh, he, he did an appalling piece of work. But, but I think for us, the, the, we can't, we can't um, get off this hook by dismissing this as a particular piece of local malpractice. We're faced with a really serious issue of, of how we undermine the categories with which people are going to Im imprison us and dismiss us. And, and um, uh, when Kevin says you can't, we're at the end times, Kevin's right, but I still think we should try. Well, so you know, yeah. one of the things that I want to say in the face of someone who says you're a right-wing homophobic extremist to say, actually, I just don't think sex is that important. As a Christian, I think, you know, there's much more to a human being than who you're sexually attracted to. Now, I, I don't think that that's not the clever one-liner that's going to upset the whole um, car. But we have to do more than say, no, it's not true. We have to take the narrative on another track so that if there's any way at all that someone will say, oh, well, that's quite interesting. You mean, there, go on. There is a way, and you have seen it done by Anglican Inc., and once upon a time, all there was was the Episcopal News Service and the church press offices. Anglican Inc., Anglican Unscripted, uh, other, I'm not, and these are the ones that we do. There are other out there who also produce copy. Our copy, our reporting is as influential, has as a larger readership than the official publications of the ACNS and the Episcopal News Service. Why is that? It's because people n do not trust what they read in ENS and ACNS. By the same token, we are not read by the people ever of who follow ENS and ACNS because they don't trust our words. But we came out of nowhere with no funding from an institution and now have a market share that is just as large. One of the things Kevin brought up the other day, and I shared this with the ACNA communicators, is that he sh Kevin shared the latest... Uh, reports on the, the viewership of videos out of Lambeth Palace. Uh, Kevin, I'll let you summarize that. If uh, Do you know the point that I'm trying to make? Well, sure. I shared both all you guys that, you know, they put out their own videos as well. And they had a, uh, a celebration of uh, women clergy. I guess it's 20 years, 25 years, how 40 years, 25 years. In See, the I, I did not celebrate it the way I should have, sorry. And so uh, they post their little videos on the Lambeth website and uh, YouTube page. I went and looked because I want to see what kind of content they're putting out. And I noticed over months and months, they get 40 views, 50 views on a really good hot topic, 70 views. And so I'm like, yo, people don't care anymore. Either they have nothing good to say that's worth listening to, possibly, or there's a better source of information out there like Anglican.inc and Anglican TV through Anglican Unscripted. And we see this in the Catholic world. Mm -hmm. We have the official Catholic publications and press offices, and then we have places like EWTN and uh, the Church Millet and other, I, I don't wish to leave anybody out, so I'll stop right there, yeah. who have as broad a viewership as do the official publications. The point is that the battle's not over within the press world, but, but, but what has been created is a vacuum and that those who, seek, who wish to seek the truth and wish to find out what's going on uh, need to support those people who are trying to fill it. David Virtue is an example. David Virtue was the first man in this game in the American Episcopal setting, and he basically stood against the Episcopal News Service for many, many years before anybody else came along. And David Virtue is prospering. Now, I, uh, he's prospering. Mm -hmm. Indeed, he was the first to the party. And uh, I, I think he's had a great influence uh, you mm -hmm. know, for the blogger that he, he uh, has put his efforts to. It's amazing to see that, yes, 
and I hate to sound like the X-Files, the truth is out there. We're out there. You know, we're out there uh, putting together uh, good journalism uh, with truth, letting people know without um, using the, the, all the, the foes of journalism uh, that this can be done correctly and accurately and with three guys who have a lot of fun doing it. Well, I, I'd like to say, I mean, all that is true, and, and, and I, there's no harm in allowing ourselves to be patted on the back, um, perhaps. I just think there's a lot more to do. The, 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 the task that this article presents us with is, is an enormously challenging one, where, sure. where to, together our job ought to be to find ways that are, are intelligent, critical, spiritually wholesome, prophetic, and accurate in order to help Christians undermine the very pernicious assault that is we're being surrounded by. We're, we're being tricked by this propaganda. And I mean, there, are, there are different stages. One is there are a number of people who think it's not propaganda, they're not being tricked and they watch Lambeth Palace videos. There are a, another group of people in the church who say something is very badly wrong and we're not completely convinced that going along with, uh, with the present zeitgeist is the right way to go. And then there are people who know it's really a very badly broken and are looking to resist. One of our jobs is to give people the, the, the intellectual and spiritual and, and, and psychological equipment to make that resistance as sharp as it could be. And there's a further category, and that's people who just don't want to know. And we've, we've, we're criticized for publishing stories uh, because why are you bringing out this bad news? It just upsets people. It'll only make the situation worse. If we just ignore it, it'll go away. I'm paraphrasing, but that's a worldview. And there are people who would rather not know these things that make their heroes and make their leaders and uh, uh, have feet of clay. So we're dealing with, uh, it's almost psychological issues of, of personality profiles of how you, how you wish to receive information. Thankfully, the, one of the paragrams of this show is to bring darkness into the light. You know, yeah, it's tough. There's there's hard uh, information the out there. Of the darkness. I, What's that? Did I say it wrong? Yeah, darkness into the light, or to shine light onto the darkness. Uh, are we trying nice. to are we trying to make darkness mainstream, <laughs> or are we trying to shine a light on that darkness to show that it is? Here's the sad <laughs> thing. We're, 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 we're ga where Gavin is, it's yeah. like nine twenty seven p.m. It's really late. He hasn't even had dinner yet. And I'm 10 times more tired than Gavin. Isn't that wrong? You and know, I'm really pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> You're really pissed off. Well, okay, so we talked enough about this. Give us a, a quick update on South Africa, because from oh, I see... Oh, the basket. No, no, from I see, uh, the clergy there are getting a little more conservative than the uh, um, leaders think it should be. Senate of South Africa met and they beat back a push by the Archbishop of Cape Town to normalize uh, homosexuality. Uh, South Africa legally has gay marriage and civil unions. The Anglican Archbishop Tabo Makoba, who by the way is the head of the design group for Lambeth 2020, has been pushing for a local option, so to speak, allowing uh, clergy in the Diocese of Cape Town and some of those in the suburbs to go ahead with gay blessings. It failed. It failed on a very narrow margin in the wider Synod. 2016, it failed 60 in the House of Bishops, 16 to 6. Now, what are we seeing happening is that the Anglican Church in Southern Africa used to be a predominantly white church amongst its clergy and parishioners. It's becoming Africanized. Many of the white clergy are emigrating. South Africa is not a very nice place to live anymore. Uh, some people don't have a place to go to, but that's a different story. And what we're seeing is that newer bishops outside of Cape Town and some of the, and Johannesburg and places like that are getting closer and closer to the mindset of their Central African brother bishops. So, and so we're seeing a slow, quiet movement of GAFCON influence expanding, but we have to wait for the current generation of leadership to go away. See, South African clergy are no longer being shipped to the UK or to Europe for advanced training because there's no money anymore. And there are no longer white missionary priests going down to South Africa because there's no money anymore. So the church is being indigenized. And as it indigenized, it gets either closer to the gospel or closer to syncretism. 
And those parts of South African church that are getting closer to the gospel are getting closer to the GAFCON movement and the wider African church. Gavin, quickly, I, I, I want to let you get to your supper here in a, in a second. Um, I want to move on and talk quickly about uh, Brexit. It looks like Brexit, in one way or another, is going to happen. What, that's a cat? You don't have a cat on your table? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm all delighted about Brexit. Your, your cat is a very calming influence. It's Brexit. <laughs> it's upsetting. Um, we are in a society where people are going mad. I mean, they are behaving in ways that are, un, are very angry and unhinged. And uh, sanity is, is, is um, seeping away. Um, the next three weeks are going to be enormously interesting and colorful. I have a view on what's going to happen, but I, this is probably isn't the moment to keep everyone out of up. up. And anyway, um, my primary focus is not politics. I think the spiritual struggle that lies behind this is extremely interesting. Um, there's going to be a crisis, and, and I think a great deal of anger. I mean, that's obvious. Uh, um, I, I, I'm not quite sure what to say that will help anybody at this particular stage. Um, I think everyone knows that, that I believe in the, the Brexit progress and democracy. George wants to say something. George, George. help me out. I'm, I'm about to, to Gavin talk. may not know what to say, but the bishops of the Church of England know what to say. What? Get out. <laughs> they actually have an opinion on something. <laughs> Jules Gomez, a friend of this show, had an article published on his website where he pointed out the Church of England bishops are completely silent on abortion, on the grooming of by Muslim gangs of working class British girls, issue after issue after issue after issue. But by God, all 118 of them can get together and say, why can't we all get along and be nice to each other? And then attack Boris Johnson for being anti-human. But, you know, I guess Boris Johnson is not part of the equation who we're supposed to be nice to. But the Church of England bishops have made a resounding statement to say nothing of any consequence, but to say it loudly. I, sh I should have mentioned that article. It was it was really excellent, and and it comes on the back of 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 this pornographic fashion show in 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 Lon London Cathedral in Southwark. Um, and and Jules is exactly right. Of all the dreadful things they might have said things about together, they could only bring themselves to write a letter saying they want more polite language. In Parliament, and I mean, yeah, it, it's 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 bankruptcy of the most hollow kind. Uh, and well, as we're on it, George, are we going to uh, impeach another president here? No, no, no. just no. The other day, yeah. uh, we've actually never impeached a president, have we? Uh, actually, the first one was officially uh, impeached, but other other ones were threatened with impeachment and resigned. So, well, Andrew, no, Andrew Johnson. I thought it failed in the House, in the Senate. I don't remember. Nixon resigned before he was impeached. Yep. Uh, uh, Clinton, Clinton was impeached by the House of Representatives, but uh, found not guilty by the Senate. So I don't right. think anybody's ever been impeached. Huh. But we're going, but, uh, you know, uh, right, you need two thirds vote in the Senate. And even if you have all the squishiest of squishy Republicans holding up their fingers in the wind to see which way it's going, you still have a, you, it's not going to happen. We, there's a false impression out there that impeachment means fired. What does impeachment mean, George? Removed from office. Nope. Or have I got it wrong? Tell you me. got it wrong. <laughs> impeachment just means it's uh, uh, the Congress is saying we don't trust you anymore. It's, it's, you, you are not removed from office. Uh, it's, but a bit the, like the way we feel about the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes. <laughs> impeachment is just part of a formal process of, uh, you know, uh, it's a slap in the hand, but you are not removed from office if you're impeached. There's that false uh, impression because Nixon left, resigned because he, you know, of course he resigned. He's about to be fired. No, he just left because he's an idiot and he was stupid. No, well, Nixon, I think you need to give Nixon credit because in 1960, he was urged to fight the uh, returns in, in Texas and Chicago because there was widespread spread cheating. That's true. And that the uh, Johnson is the senator from Texas and Mayor Daley of Chicago fixed the outcome for those two states. And that gave the election to Kennedy. And Eisenhower urged him to fight back. And Nixon said, no, it would destroy the republic, which is going to work. There are moments when we have to have a sense of proportion. And I'm weighing up my burnt sausages against this expedition. <laughs> oh, here we go. We're done. <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. <laughs> I'm George Conger. 
I'm Gavin Ashenden about to eat supper. You've been listening to episode 539 of Anglican Unscripted on the 30th of September. What's not to like? <laughs>